It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm greatly honored for this invitation and the opportunity, opportunity to present you uh, the results of my um, 30 years uh, research on the topic. I started uh, by working on my PhD thesis. Uh, I was uh, supervised by uh, my present um, director of this institute, Professor Kobich, who at that time worked on optimum measurement uh, systems for state estimation. At that time, it was at the end of the 1980s, it was a very popular topic. And uh, I switched to a quite a similar topic regarding parameter estimation. Uh, in my mini course, I'd like to focus your attention on a broader context of optimum experimental design, which uh, has uh, uh, received uh, considerable, considerable attention in recent years and becomes more and more popular. And uh, although in its history it had, it had its ups and downs, but mostly ups. So uh, we start by some, uh, something very simple. As for my um, town, Zielona Góra, in German it's Greenberg, it's uh, Green Mountain in uh, English, but there are no mountains there, only some hills, uh, a lot of forests. It's uh, located close to the border with Germany. The population is 120,000 uh, people, uh, very, very nice uh, place to, to, to live. And we have a university uh, which is pretty well known in, in uh, Poland and uh, abroad. Uh, it, the number of students is about 20,000. Uh, my mini course is split into three parts, but here we have two parts. The first part uh, will be concerned with the introduction to experimental design, some motivations, and uh, some introduction to specifics re related to mm, uh, systems described by partial differential equations. Uh, the two parts uh, will be confined to the second uh, part here. Uh, they will be mostly concerned with applications, some specific advances, and some open problems. Ah. So let's start by a simple example. Uh, I, I'm not sure if, uh, how familiar you are with statistics, but this problem uh, should be familiar even in the context of approximation. So we have uh, an four measurements. We have uh, some sp settings of the regressor X. And uh, for each setting, we have the corresponding observation denoted by Y. So we have four points, and we want to uh, fit a line to. to we want to fit a line to uh, these points. So the setting is pretty classical. Uh, so we want to minimize simultaneously uh, the residuals, which are um, the distances from the line to the actual measurements. Uh, we have four uh, residuals. We want to do it at the same time. So a uh, logical thing to do is to minimize some uh, compounded crit criterion, we, which is just the sum of squared residuals. Uh, so uh, this criterion is called the least squares criterion I in statistics. And uh, as you can see, uh, the values of the regressor and the values of the observations of, of the responses are uh, specific real numbers. So the only unknowns are uh, A0 and A1. And uh, when we plot this function, its surface is uh, just uh, some square uh, surface. So it has some minimum. We can get this minimum when we equate the partial derivatives of this criterion with respect to uh, the parameters to zero. In this way, we obtain the following system of linear equations. So this makes uh, uh, the whole stuff very easy. Mm, uh, these equations are called normal equations in, in the language of statistics. And uh, we can put them in a matrix form. Uh, 
this matrix, capital F, is decisive critical here because it collects the settings of the independent uh, variable of the regressor. So we have, uh, here we have four settings of our regressor. So this matrix uh, has four rows. And uh, theta collects uh, the unknowns and y collects all the observations. So this is a, a vector, a column vector with four elements. Uh, in this setting, we, we can uh, derive closed form formulae for the, the values of, for the best values of the par parameters uh, for the line, and we can plot this line. So this is uh, very, very. I think this is very uh, well known and uh, very classical. Mm, we can generalize it to fitting a parabola. So uh, the formulae are just the same. The matrix capital F changes. So uh, in the model, we have some additional term related to the squares of the regressor. So in this matrix, uh, the third column uh, appears uh, with the squares of the regressor values. Uh, so the, the normal equations are the same. Uh, we can uh, generalize it to uh, some uh, other forms of uh, our model, not necessarily to a linear model or not necessarily to a quadratic model. We can uh, put here some more complicated uh, um, basis functions like uh, exponential functions, signs, and so on. Uh, one condition is that the response uh, should be linear with respect to the, the unknown parameters. Uh, let's um, think a, b a bit about the influence of uh, the noise, because noise is inherent in the measurements. Uh, let's think about the influence of the noise on the accuracy of the estimates, and about possibly reducing the influence of this noise. So. Let's consider the following example, which will introduce you to uh, the um, thriving field of, of exp experimental design. Uh, we have here a pan balance, and we want to weigh some objects. Uh, so we put some objects on the left pan, and uh, we put some objects on the right pan, and uh, we have also some um, weights, calibrated weights, and we add them to a lighter pan in order to uh, put uh, the balance in an equilibrium. So uh, the sum of the calibrated weights is, uh, is just uh, the difference of, of the weights of, of uh, the objects on the on one pan and uh, on one pan and on the other pan. So. Uh, it is easy to see that our measurements are a bit noisy, so we have some equilibrium, we observe some equilibrium, but it is not necessarily uh, a result which, is, which has an infinite uh, precision. So we have some uh, measurements errors which are unavoidable. Uh, we can characterize uh, the distribution of these errors by uh, the number sigma, which is the standard deviation of, of the measurement errors. And um, assume that we have two objects, A and B, and we want to measure the masses. A uh, first strategy which comes to our mind is to measure them separately. So we put object A on the left-hand left pan, and then we put standardized waste on, on the right-hand pan so as to put, uh, uh, so as to make um, uh, the balance uh, in equilibrium. Uh, as a result, we have here the measurements y for the measurement y1 for the object A, and uh, we can because we have some uncertainty due to measurements errors, we, we can uh, express this uh, in the following way. Uh, we uh, can write that uh, the mass of object A is just our measurement plus minus, minus 
the standard deviation uh, of, of the measurement noise. The same uh, can be done with, uh, the, with object B, and we have another measurement here, Y2, uh, and uh, the uncertainty in, in the measurements is, is the same. Uh, so, for example, if uh, the measurements are 10 and 25 grams, so we can write here the following results. So, this is a very clear strategy for, for an engineer, but what uh, if um, we change the strategy? Before uh, this uh, analysis, uh, let's remark that uh, the strategy can be put in, in matrix form. Uh, we can um, we can express these equations in the following form. So here you have uh, your matrix uh, capital F. Uh, the first row corresponds to the measurement uh, of uh, the way of the object A, and the second row corresponds to the measurement of the matrix of the, the uh, weight of, of the, the of object B. Uh, the unknowns are the masses of the objects, and epsilon is just uh, the, the uh, column vector of measurement noise. Now, I can compute here uh, the determinant of the transposed matrix capital F and the matrix uh, capital F. For the moment, it, it is uh, not clear why to compute th this quantity, but le let's compute it. In, in a while, I will explain you why uh, we do it. Uh, the determinant in this case is 1. So let's change the strategy, and now uh, let's uh, measure the masses of the two objects, but uh, when they are in combination, we put objects A and B on one, pan, uh, we measure uh, how it weights, and then we put uh, them on different planes simultaneously, and we put here another uh, standard weights. So now uh, we uh, have the following equations for the measurements. Uh, we can uh, write uh, the, mm, the values for the masses. They are the following functions of the uh, mm, measurements. So it's just uh, solving a system of linear equations. What, uh, what, uh, this, what does it, this give us is that when we compute the variance of the mass A uh, using some rules uh, relate, uh, from statistics, uh, which are related to uh, the computation of the variance. So uh, we can mm, uh, put uh, a constant one uh, divided w one half uh, in front of the variance, but it must be squared. So it is, you can see here, one fourth. And uh, irrespective of uh, the fact if you have here a minus or plus sign, uh, the variance of the difference or the variance of the sum is always the sum of the variances. So here uh, you have the following expression for the variance cap of the mass capital A. And surprisingly, we, you can see here that the variance is lower than in the previous case. Uh, so now, uh, when we uh, mm, compute uh, the square root of the variance, we get uh, the standard deviation. It is not uh, sigma as before, but sigma divided by uh, the square root of 2. So this reduced our uncertainty. Our uncertainty was one point, uh, 0 0.1, and now it is 1.07, so it's, it, it, it's much lower. Uh, now the matrix uh, capital F has the following form, and let's note that the determinant is four times higher. We can uh, repeat the whole experiment uh, uh, with weighing four objects. So our first strategy, we have here four objects, A, B, C, and D. Uh, uh, we have a, 
experiment, the experimental, experimental budget of four measurements. We can only take four measurements. So let's uh, measure uh, the masses of the individual objects separately as it, this was the case uh, at the beginning for two objects. So here you can see uh, the matrix capital F, uh, the determinant is one, and uh, now uh, you have another strategy. Uh, here we have, oh, we have four measurements, but we, we, we measure, we weigh combinations of uh, some objects. So here we have a, B put on one pan, here we have C and D put one pan, uh, A, B put on different pans, and D and C put on different pans. In this framework, uh, we have the following equations uh, for the measurements, so we can recover from these equations uh, the values of the individual masses. And now, uh, the, the uncertainty is also reduced by the square root of 2. But this is not the last word. We can, uh, we, we can, uh, we can hear um, uh, so the determinant uh, of the matrix capital F, which is transposed by multiplied by capital F is 16. Now we change the strategy, and the third strategy is a bit more complicated, not so obvious. And for this strategy, we can write the corresponding equations. We can derive the equations for the individual masses. And when we compute the variance of, the variances of um, uh, our estimates of the masses, it turns out uh, that uh, the standard deviations are the standard deviations of the noise divided by two. So the result is even better than uh, the previous one for the second strategy. It can be shown that this result can't be improved. And when we compute the determinant of this matrix, it's, uh, it is as high as 256. Uh, by measuring individual uh, masses, we got here one, and here we have 256. Uh, so uh, we, you, you, as you can see here, uh, w by appropriately designing um, the strategy of taking measurements, uh, we can significantly reduce the uncertainty in uh, our estimates. And uh, this reduction in the uncertainty is accompanied by an increase in the determinant of this matrix. So this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, Our network is very irritating. <laughs> <laughs> very obstinate. <laughs> this matrix is called the Fisher Information Matrix, capi capital M. Uh, Ronald Fisher was a well-known statistician who lived at the beginning of the 20th century, and he founded modern statistics. So uh, he ha has had a lot of contributions, and one of the most uh, significant contributions was uh, the invention of modern experimental design. So this stuff was uh, among uh, his works. And uh, as you can see, uh, we can uh, we can find best conditions for, for our experiment by maximizing the determinant of this information matrix. So this is very critical. And in my talk, in my mini course, you, you, you uh, will be able to see maximization of this determinant uh, many times. So it is uh, the most popular optimality criterion used in experimental design. So if we know the tools, if we know what uh, the information metric is, so we can try, we can attempt to uh, design uh, our exp uh, some experiment uh, ourselves. So, so let's uh, consider the following exercise. We uh, want to, uh, we want to estimate 
the values of uh, the parameters here, a0 and a1, by setting the values of the regressor x. Uh, we assume that we can manipulate with our regressor uh, one way or another, uh, we can set any value in the interval from minus 1 to 1. So we can vary this continuously. But our experimental budget consists only of two measurements. So we can only take two measurements. We want to do it best. Uh, best means we want to achieve the highest accuracy in estimating A0 and A1. So uh, we have to design two settings uh, of X and then we take observations uh, Y corresponding to these settings and then uh, we estimate, uh, we fit a line. In this case, we just draw a line through the two points. And um, what uh, are the best settings? So our observations uh, have this form. And in matrix form, this can be written uh, like this. And the matrix capital F uh, can be seen here. Uh, we can write the determinant of the information matrix, it is based on capital F, in the following form. It, after some very simple algebra, you get the following form. So uh, if this determinant is to be maximized, uh, this means that this expression should be maximum. This means that uh, we should uh, take uh, the values of the regressor which are at the extre uh, extreme points of the, the design interval. Uh, one, ex uh, one setting would be minus one and the other setting would be one. So uh, it, according to this methodology, uh, it is not worth measuring uh, some, somewhere in the middle of this interval just at, at the ex extreme uh, points of the design interval. If we were to take more uh, measurements, the result would be the same. So if we uh, were to take 10 measurements, so uh, the, the optimum design, the, the settings which uh, maximize the determinant of the information matrix would be that one half of the measurements should be uh, ta uh, taken at uh, one extreme point, uh, another half of the measurements should be uh, taken at uh, another point. For any other settings, the value of the determinant would be worse and the accuracy would be worse. Uh, for a practitioner, this could be a bit surprising because, well, uh, it is natural to do some measurements in the uh, in the middle of this interval, we get some new information. Why to take measurements only at two points? Why to repeat measurements? Uh, but uh, here, uh, we assume that our model is, uh, uh, is accurate. So uh, we are in the framework of model-based experimental design. So when we assume that our model is perfect, so, well, yes, yes, yes. Exactly. So, uh, so this uh, makes some controversy about experimental design, uh, but there are some, of course, some some uh, responses from um, some answers from uh, statisticians. Well, we can uh, invent some other uh, means of s distributing uh, measurements at other points in order to avoid this this phenomenon. But at the beginning, in the simplest case you have this situation. So we have repetitions. So repetitions will be also uh, present in my talk which regards a more complicated case. If you have a more general model, the same linear model with some general matrix capital F which uh, includes information about the settings of the independent variables a variable, one variable or more variables, it, it, it depends on the case we are dealing with. And uh, this matrix is uh, multiplied by a vector of unknown coefficients which are to be estimated. Uh, the measurements are disturbed by noise. We assume that uh, this noise has zero mean, which is quite natural. And we assume that uh, uh, 
the uh, uh, individual measurements have um, independent uh, noise. So, well, uh, this means that the covariance matrix for this vector um, epsilon is diagonal. So, uh, like in, in this uh, bal uh, balance, uh, uh, pan balance, so all the measurements had the same um, standard deviation for, for the noise. So we assume that this is the case. So this is the same simplest framework. So in this case, uh, if you uh, repeated the experiment many times, um, so we, you, rec you recorded uh, uh, different uh, values of capital Y, different values of observations. Uh, on the average, um, the values of the estimates from these experiments, from these repetitions, would be uh, concentrated around the true value of, of the parameter. So we assume that our model is perfect. So <laughs> it, it, if for this setting, if we repeated the experiment many times, in each repetition we would measure several times uh, mm, the, we would record several times uh, the realizations of, of the uh, response why uh, then we would get many many estimates, many values of uh, the estimates of our uh, uh, vector theta. These estimates are denoted here by theta hat, and on the average, they would be concentrated around um, the true value of the parameter. This is a good news. So, well, we get more or less the true value, but on the condition that we repeat experiments. In, in, in reality, we do only one experiment. So, well, uh, how to do it, I will, I'm going to explain in, in the following slides. And uh, apart from uh, this measure of location, apart from the expectation, we have a dispersion, dispersion of the measurements, of the, of the estimates, and the, the, the dispersion of the estimates is measured by the covariance, ma covariance matrix. And in this covariance matrix, you see here uh, the information matrix. So the covariance matrix is proportional to the inverse of the information matrix. Uh, so if we want to have small dis dispersion, we should make the elements of, of this matrix small. Why? Let's uh, consider the following example. You have here theta 1, theta 2, only two parameters to be estimated. Here is the true value of the parameter. Uh, if we take one experiment, if we make uh, one experiment, uh, we collect some observations, we estimate the parameters theta 1 and theta 2, we get an estimate of this parameter. Of course, there is some distance. Uh, between them, and uh, this is for one repetition. And in reality, we, we perform this experiment only one, uh, only uh, one time. And uh, but assume for a moment that we have a big experimental budget, so we can repeat the whole uh, uh, stuff many times. We can perform. Uh, the same series of experiments many times. In this way, we, we could get not only one estimate, but many estimates. They would form the following cloud of points. So this cloud of points can be like this. This is very nebulous, so um, the dispersion is high. But if we play with uh, the settings of our independent variables, if we design our experiment properly, we, we can get the following result. So we, can, we also have uh, some cloud of points, but this cloud is much um, uh, smaller. It's much smaller. What does it give, you, give us? Uh, what does it give to practitioners? In reality, we perform only one experiment. So in this situation, if we have this situation, it concerns 
many repetitions, but in practice we uh, do only one experiment. When we have this situation, when we perform our experiment only one, once, it is included in this cloud. We are pretty sure that we are close to the true values of the parameters. We don't have such certainty in this case. So, well, uh, when we uh, perform our experiment only once, when we can get a point here, for example. So the distance to the two parameters is, can be really high. So uh, the idea of experimental design is to select experimental conditions to get this situation. So we, we have uh, the uncertainty ellipsoid because the points can be enclosed in an ellipsoid. Um, uh, the the, the cell ellipsoid should be, should, be, should be small. What does it mean? Well, because it's easy to say, well, we, we should make this ellipsoid small. We should uh, put everything in a framework uh, which is easy to, for, for optimization methods. So we should introduce some optimality criterion. And in optimum experimental design, we can have uh, many uh, optimality criteria. For example, uh, the most popular criteria is the determinant of the inverse of the information matrix. So, let's come back to this slide. You, here you have um, the inverse of the information matrix. Uh, the covariance of the estimates that is to say, a measure of uh, dispersion of the estimates is proportional to uh, the inverse of this information matrix. We want to make this covariance matrix small, so this means we, want, we should make uh, this matrix small, and uh, the easiest way is to minimize the determinant of uh, this matrix. In this way, we minimize the volume of the corresponding ellipsoid. Uh, we can take the inverse in front of the log that function. So basically, we can maximize, we, we, can minimize, we should minimize this criterion, which means that we maximize the determinant of the information matrix. This is the most popular optimality criterion, which is called the optimality criterion. Uh, D comes from determinant. Uh, the next criterion is the the A optimality criterion, uh, we can uh, minimize the trace of the inverse of the information matrix. This means that we minimize the mean uh, length of uh, uh, the mean axis length of the uncertainty ellipsoid. Uh, why is this so? Why not to use only one criterion, which, which is universal? Can you imagine what uh, the, the danger is with using this criterion? We can have a very, we can have a very low volume of the ellipsoid, but this ellipsoid can be pretty elongated. So one axis is uh, very small, the other axis is is uh, large, but if we, we might multiply them, which uh, gives you the determinant, you have a very small number. But the uncertainty along, along one axis, uh, the uncertainty will be pretty high. So for this reason, uh, this criterion is, someone is uh, sometimes criticized. Um, it is used because uh, it leads to uh, very mm, uh, easy computations when we compare this with other criteria. But we should, shouldn't forget, forget about uh, the danger which is related to this criteria. Mm, uh, the A optimality criterion is a bit better, but the attendant computations are a bit more, uh, more uh, time consuming. We can also uh, minimize uh, the length of the long, longest, of the largest uh, axis of the uncertainty ellipsoid. Uh, this is the, the, the so-called A-optimality criterion. A, uh, E-optimality criterion 
E comes from uh, the eigenvalue. Uh, a optimality, the letter A, comes from uh, the average optimality. Mm. Here you can see only three criteria. Uh, basically, uh, during, well, almost 100 years of the development of optima, uh, optimum experimental, de experimental design, almost all letters in the alphabet uh, were used to invent uh, different criteria. And uh, the funny thing is that they often yield different solutions. So, uh, so some, some authors prefer one criterion, some authors prefer other criteria. So uh, it, for, for a novice, it's sometimes hard to uh, find uh, 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 some re good recommendation for, for this. Uh, which, which criterion to use. Uh, as for the story, uh, well, uh, it, it, it was started, well, maybe in the 1920s, uh, but uh, uh, real development uh, started uh, in the years uh, after the end of the World War II. And uh, it, it was concerned mostly, mostly with factorial, factorial experiments and the applications in industry so ma mainly in chemical engineering. Uh, the modern experimental design, which is related to optimality criteria, um, started in the 1950s. And it is related to the name of two statisticians, Kiefer and Wolfowitz. I will show you some form of the Kiefer-Wolfowitz theorem in a few uh, moments. And um, as for the algorithms, well, they were developed uh, uh, with the development of computers. So uh, the story started at the beginning of the 1970s and uh, it is related to two names, uh, Valery Fedorov. It is, uh, well, it is one of the biggest names in, in the modern optimum experimental design. Uh, this is a man who is still very active, still very bright. Mm, maybe he's in his 80s now. Uh, I met him very often at conferences, so Valery is always uh, very open-minded, always very critical about uh, uh, people who present something. Well, and the, the classical uh, uh, criticism is, well, this was already invented in Russia in the 1960s, well, in some Novosibirsk or some other center. And, uh, but basically, he's a very friendly man, man and he has a lot of ideas. And he mm, uh, moved many ideas from optimization, many ideas from optimization in measure spaces to experimental design. So I, I appreciate this very much. And another uh, big uh, name is Henry Wynne. Henry Wynne is also very active. Uh, he's retired now. Uh, he worked uh, his work for many years in, uh, at London School of Economics. And uh, he now he also uh, uh, attends uh, many conferences regarding uncertainty and and so on. So he, he always open to to new trends, and uh, so, well, I, uh, my plan is to be active uh, like uh, them <laughs> till uh, my eighties at least. <laughs> and um, in the nineteen seventies, uh, some uh, uh, great interest. Uh, was uh, appeared among people related to control engineering. And Raman Mera is uh, among the greatest names of that period. Uh, he uh, started optimum input design for state estimation, ba basically. So uh, this is a very um, active trend, input design. Um, there are many sessions, there are many plenary lectures uh, on optimum input design, uh, which uh, can be, um, uh, which are present at conferences for um, identification. So uh, it, it has a strong community, uh, people who are concerned with this. Um, well, unfortunately, I don't have time to 
dive into this topic and uh, show you well um, uh, some some stuff which is uh, some achievements. But I will nevertheless I will uh, hint to you some sources for for um, reading if, if you want to um, uh, get acquainted with this topic. And the 1980s up to now. Uh, this uh, golden area for optimal sensor placement uh, and uh, input signal design for systems described by partial differential equations. So it has some up and downs, uh, but uh, I think this is uh, now we have uh, the, the great up of, of this uh, uh, research area. So uh, this is um, a slide. Well, this is a slide from a conference which uh, held in uh, at Cambridge at Newton at Isaac Newton Institute at Cambridge I organized it in 2011 uh, well uh, here we had here uh, Andre Bardov from uh, Aachen uh, so he gave a very nice talk and uh, on on ill post on design from ill post systems uh, I mentioned about this event because it seems to me from time to time that people from statistics and people from engineering develop maybe the same ideas independently. And this leads to a rediscovery of, of experimental design. Well, after some years, engineers discover s some facts which already exist in uh, statistics. And, uh, but they don't, don't know about it, and vice versa. Some statisticians uh, um, cons uh, con uh, study some abstract problems. They don't know applications for them, whereas the applications are ready in the engineering community. But nobody knows about them. So it, it's this workshop, the, one of the objectives of this workshop was to collect statisticians and engineers uh, in one place to, uh, for, for discussion. So unfortunately, this is only one of a few uh, events of this type. Here you can see my colleague Evaris Rafaiwovich. Uh, I will um, call his name uh, several times during my talk. Uh, well, uh, uh, his works were one of the motivation to uh, start uh, research on uh, partial differential equations and uh, parameter estimation. He's uh, still active and um, uh, he's going to publish a book on input design for uh, a system described by, by partial differential equations. It's going to be published uh, by De Gruyter. Well, it, it, um, uh, I, he asked me to uh, read uh, this book and uh, ask for some corrections if, if, they, uh, if this would be possible. So uh, I think that the, the, s the book should be published now within several months. Of, so, so, well, maybe at the beginning of the next year. So uh, for me, it's a very good, it would be a very good book on, uh, for a novice. It's not on a very low topics, on, on the very high uh, level topics, but uh, it starts by some very nice examples and uh, there are some new topics, but uh, uh, it is a book which, is, uh, mm, which will be fantastic, fantastic for PhD students. So I, I will announce. Input In input design methods for uh, the, mm, uh, pa uh, distributed parameter systems or so. So if, if you are interested in, in this uh, title, so it seems to me it's already announced by De Gruyter, but uh, I w as I uh, read this book, so I, I know the title, but I, I don't have it uh, with me now. Uh, so uh, this will be perhaps the best, uh, the first book on input design uh, in this context. Uh, there is a strong community which is concerned with input design for systems described by uh, difference equations. So there are people from um, uh, Sweden, or like Håkan Helmarsson. Oh, yeah. uh, they are very active, um, but uh, no, none of them uh, has written a book. Uh, here uh, you, you can see uh, Henry Wynne. 
It's a very solid man. And Anthony Atkinson, it is, uh, well, it is a friend of mine, I can say, so uh, we wrote some, some papers together. So he's still very active. Uh, so this is the workshop in Cambridge. So I also organized uh, uh, one of the series of conferences on experimental design. This is, uh, these are conferences for statisticians, uh, but uh, they are organized every three years. So uh, you, you can see here that the community is not pretty big, so, but uh, they are really very active. So this was in 2013. And uh, here, well, uh, the book which uh, is a summary of my results uh, achieved up to 2005. And this is another book by my former PhD student, uh, Maciej Patan. Uh, it was published uh, by Springer in 2012. It is, well, it can be, we can say that it is an extension of the result, results presented in my books towards um, sensor networks. So we, we still collaborate uh, and uh, most of our publications are uh, in tandem with Machi. So as for distributed parameter systems, uh, consider the following example. It concerns a metal block with a crack uh, in the middle. We hit uh, this block from one side and uh, you can observe the evolution of the temperature as time elapses. Uh, we have here a precise model. This is the following heat equation. Uh, well, the model is known uh, very well up to the value of this parameter up to the value of this heat coefficient, theta. Uh, we assume here for simplicity that it is a const constant. Mm, we know perfectly boundary conditions, we know perfectly the initial uh, conditions, they are zero. And the question is uh, that we want to uh, recover, we want to estimate the value of the heat coefficients, coefficient based on measurements. But the question is where to place the sensor in order to uh, do it most efficiently, most accurately. So some uh, symmetry, because the initial conditions and uh, the boundary conditions are symmetrical uh, uh, with respect to this line. So our intuition says that uh, the sensor should be placed somewhere here on, the, on this line. But where exactly? So this is, this is a real problem. Uh, so such situations uh, are common in engineering, engineering practice. Uh, and uh, well, the question is where to put sensors, how many sensors should be used? So this is a question which is always uh, asked by, by engineers. Uh, this results from the fact that distributed parameter systems that is to say, systems described by partial differential equations have spatial uh, temporal dynamics. Everything changes in time and in space. But we don't have an opportunity to measure the state, the distribution of, of the uh, state variable um, at all space points. So we should select well, several measurement devices, put them and take measurements. So this uh, leads some complications. Of course, um, in recent years, we have observed some change in this um, uh, setting because we can measure the state using cameras. But I, uh, this is uh, some pretty new approach and uh, on, related to, uh, to only to some applications. So uh, I, I'm, go I'm not going to talk about it. So in the remainder of my talk, I, I'm going to focus your attention on systems described by partial differential equations. And the question is how to organize observations in order to um, estimate the unknown parameters uh, most accurately. Uh, so these are the locations. But this is 
only the tip of an iceberg because we have we can have several strategies of taking measurements we can uh, locate the sensors uh, in a stationary manner so we uh, fix the sensor positions at selected points and the positions uh, don't change uh, during the measurements we can also use the so-called scanning uh, this means that we, we can have several uh, measure, uh, several uh, sensors, many sensors uh, distributed, deployed over the special area, but at a given time moment, only some of them take measurements. Um, the question is, uh, why not to use all, all the sensors? Uh, because in this way, uh, we reduce the system complexity and uh, the cost of operation and maintenance. Mm, uh, this is a typical situation when we have sensor networks, uh, when uh, sensor nodes are, um, use energy supplied from batteries. And so in order to uh, make the operation longer, the measurements uh, sh should, be, uh, should uh, be short. In this way, uh, the batteries are not exhausted. Uh, we can also use mobile sensors well, when I started the research in this direction uh, at the beginning of the 1990s and uh, did some presentations, uh, well, the first question was, how to, this is impossible, how to uh, use mobile observations? Maybe when we have some uh, meteorological variables, we can use some balloons, but how to select the trajectories? Well, so the question was very delicate and people were very skeptical. Now the question changed completely. Uh, mobile observations are some, something natural. We can use mobile robots, we can use drones, we can use planes, aircraft. Well, it's technically uh, possible. But then the question is how to design the trajectories of, of uh, sensors. So, so I, I've, men I've already mentioned uh, sensor networks. Uh, sensor nodes are Mm, mini com miniature computers. Uh, they have a microprocessors, microprocessor, and uh, they have their own data storage, a number of sensors, uh, and they can communicate with uh, each other. So they are deployed quite densely, uh, close to physical phenomena, and they can communicate, uh, making sensing uh, close to physical phenomena. They have some specific software. So uh, they started uh, developing at the beginning of uh, the first decade of this uh, century. Uh, they, the research started from uh, military applications, but now we are surrounded by various sensors. So, well, I think this will be uh, even more developed in the future. But before the invention of sensor networks, <coughs> the, um, uh, the optimal experimental design for uh, partial differential system described by partial differential equations uh, started in the 1980s. And uh, at first, the idea was to reduce the problem to uh, optimum sensor location for state estimation. Why? Because at that time, uh, people uh, were concerned with uh, ca the Kalman filter. Uh, well, we, for example, we uh, um, have several measurement uh, stations located along, um, located in a city, and uh, we want to monitor uh, the the pollutant uh, um, uh, pollutant um, concentration along an urban area, uh, but at that time it was uh, a problem to uh, locate many sensors because they were very expensive. So the idea was instead of let's say 200 sensors deployed over um, an urban area maybe it's better to use 20 sensors, but located in an intelligent manner. And um, uh, use, using uh, the measurements from these measure measurement stations, using observations as selected points, uh, the question was how to 
uh, uh, how to estimate uh, the profile, the, the surface of the pollution concentration of the, the whole area. And uh, to this end, a Kalman filter was used. Um, of course, at that time, the computational possibilities were relatively uh, low, but uh, in spite of that, a great number of the theoretical works uh, appeared at that time. Uh, and the first idea for parameter estimation was to use the methodology for state estimation. This was uh, uh, the, done very easily. Uh, the, the, the set of equations describing our uh, system, the set of partial differential equations, was extended by adding uh, some additional equations regarding the parameters. The equations were very simple. Uh, the derivatives uh, of, of the parameters with respect to uh, time were zero. So uh, uh, in this way, we could uh, reduce uh, the parameter estimation to state estimation by augmenting uh, the state by the unknown parameters. Unfortunately, this didn't work. In theory, uh, there were some difficulties because, because in this way the problem be became highly nonlinear. Even if the mo model was linear, after augmenting the state uh, by adding the parameters, everything became very nonlinear. So the analysis became very cumbersome. And from the computational point of view, well, it was a tragedy, a tragedy at that time. Uh, interest in, in this type of problems uh, uh, revived uh, in the recent 20 years, when computational possibilities uh, made it possible. Um, we can also use some random field analysis. Uh, well, th there are some works uh, in this direction. Uh, when we, ha we can treat uh, our system, uh, uh, our measurement as a realization of a random field, uh, we observe this random field at selected points, and we can try to estimate the covariance function for this random field. And um, the parameters appearing in the partial differential equations uh, could be found in this covariance function. So when we uh, estimate this covariance function, well, after some uh, efforts, it could be possible to uh, rediscover the values of the uh, estimates of, of the parameters. But the, the approach is by no means universal, so you can find it only in several papers. The, the bulk of the papers is on using a classical optimum experimental design with all uh, the, the optimality criteria like D optimality, A optimality, and so on. Uh, you, you know this stuff. I started by the optimality criteria of this type. And in the rest of my uh, talk, I'd like to uh, um, focus your attention on, on, this, uh, on this problem. Uh, so let's start by a general description of uh, our system. Uh, so we have a system described by partial differential equations. Here, capital F is uh, the operator in which y you can find s uh, some special derivatives. Uh, why is the state vector? It depends on the spatial variable x and on, on time t. And theta is the vector of unknown parameters. So, for example, we can have uh, the process of air pollution. We have some contaminant source. And the problem is where to place the sensor we don't know the position of this contaminant. We want to estimate this position based on measurements. But uh, if we don't know the position of, of this um, contaminant uh, source, uh, where to put the sensor? Unfortunately, uh, we can't rely on our intuition because the process is too complicated. We have here uh, the velocity field, uh, the wind velocity field, uh, which, is a, which can be quite complicated. And it can spoil uh, our intuition. It, it, can, uh, it can destroy uh, what we invent based on our intuition. So it is not clear where to put the sensor. We should use the model, the physical model of the process. And in this case, this 
partial differential equation takes the following form. Uh, so here you have the, the contaminant uh, source described by some function f. Uh, we, ha we are in the setting of parameter estimation, so we uh, assume that the form of this uh, function is known, but there can be some uh, unknown parameters uh, in this uh, source. I will show you some example in, in the SQL, uh, so you will see that how, how it works. And we, you can have here some uh, diffusion, diffusivity coefficient. It, is, it can be uh, specially, special dependent. It, 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 it may be not constant. It, it can vary uh, in space. So the question is that we don't, uh, we, we aren't we don't have any possibility to measure it directly. We can only discover it, discover it, rediscover it using um, measurements. So, for so we assume that we have a model for our uh, special temporal process, and this is one or more partial if differential equations. In these equations, some parameters are unknown. Uh, we place some uh, mm, measurement uh, devices, and they, mm, in a simplest case, case they measure uh, the state at selected points. So here, x1 to xn are uh, the sensor positions, and y are the state. Uh, y denotes the state uh, measured at these positions. We assume that the measurements are corrupted by noise. As for the properties of noise, we assume that it is zero mean, which is quite, lo quite uh, classical. And we assume that, well, uh, for this noise, even if we observe um, uh, y at the same place, at the same location, uh, the um, uh, values of uh, y at different time points are independent of one, one another. So this is um, quite abstract. Uh, in practice, they are correlated. If we have measurements from one sensor, well, it is, the measurements are correlated in time, but for simplicity, we assume here they are, that they are not correlated. It is possible to take correlations in, in time, but it complicates uh, the corresponding formulae uh, so much that uh, it is easier to uh, put this uh, um, simplification, to Im impose the simplification and um, having some, uh, to have something uh, um, tractable. But we can assume here that the correlations uh, between uh, measurements from different stations can be observed. So in this setting, uh, we all can also formulate uh, the, the least squares criterion, like in the first example in, in my mini course today. Uh, we uh, computed the estimates of the parameters theta by minimizing this criterion. It is a measure of this, the discrepancy between the observations, denoted here by z, and uh, the measurements and uh, the responses produced by our numerical model, but because eventually when we uh, use, um, when we estimate theta, uh, we s must solve uh, the partial differential equations many times for different uh, thetas in order to find a theta which uh, minimizes this criterion. And this is most often done using uh, simulation models based on the final element method and so on. Mm, so here you comp compare actual observations with uh, the responses generated by our mm, numerical model, and we want to make uh, this criterion as small as possible. So uh, we want to uh, find uh, optimal sensor positions before taking actual measurements. Uh, so this is uh, one uh, inconvenience. Um, then we put uh, sensors at optimal locations and take measurements. So uh, one, one inconvenience is that we must design uh, sensor positions before 
um, performing uh, the actual experiment. How to? Hmm? Sorry, I lost my concentration. Uh, it is uh, the matrix, uh, the covariance kernel for uh, th this mat matrix whose uh, components are uh, collect uh, the covariances uh, between uh, noises at different observation sites. So we have different uh, measurement stations, uh, and w you assume that uh, there may be a correlation between the measurements. Um, there is some, some uh, in, in reality, there is some um, co correlation because there, there, is, there, are some, there may be some processes uh, which are not included in our model and they act on the whole process at two sites. So basically, you, you can observe some correlations, some special correlation uh, of your state variable. So. Mm -hmm. Is the correlation of the noise, right? Yes, the noise. Not of the scale. No, 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 no. Yes, yes. Exactly. It, it, it concerns the noise. But um, basically, as you can, as you can see uh, in a while, uh, for simplicity, we use uncorrel the uncorrelated uh, case. Uh, it is possible, I, I wrote it uh, here, in order to show you that it is possible to include uh, the correlations, but in uh, practice uh, we uh, assume that the observations are also uncorrelated in, in space. So the most classical assumption is that uh, there are no correlations in time, no correlations in space. In this case you get the following form of the information matrix. So uh, this simplifies things. Otherwise, uh, if you have here correlations in space, here the sum must be double, so there are two sums, uh, one with index i and one with index j, and here you have here the inverse of uh, the matrix capital Q, which makes the computations much harder. Mm, as you can see, using this maybe artificial assumption, um, uh, we can invent very smart computational methods based on uh, convex optimization uh, which uh, makes make everything easy um, using uh, correlations including correlations um, uh, results in the um, loss of convexity so the problem becomes much more complicated there are some approaches to, to, to use it but maybe not at this uh, introductory level I'm going to talk about. So we have here the information matrix and here you can see that a, f a nice thing about this uh, fission information matrix is that it is a sum of matrices coming from different points. So each term in the sum comes from a different special point where a sensor is located. So this makes the problem uh, much more tractable. And here uh, you, you can see the vector G, uh, which, is, uh, which collects the derivatives of the state variable with respect to the unknown parameters. These co are called the uh, sensitivity coefficients. And uh, this vector has, of course, the number of components which is equal to the number of unknown parameters. For example, we can compute uh, the sensitivity vector G using three methods. We can use finite difference method, we can use sensitivity equation method, and we can use the variational method. Uh, the most popular is the sensitivity equation method, which works in the following way. We have, for example, the following equation. Uh, here you can see the diffusion coefficient, and in this diffusion coefficient you, you can find two parameters, a and b. And uh, the function uh, psi is known. It is, for example, the sum of uh, the two uh, special uh, variables. 
so uh, the diffusion coefficient is parameterized by two parameters and this basis function psi. And uh, how to compute the derivatives of the state y with respect to the parameters uh, y and b. You can differentiate the state equation with respect to a, then you can do the same with respect to b, so you, you have two additional equations uh, and after this differentiation uh, you have one equation, one uh, additional equation where uh, the derivative of y with respect to a appears and the second equation where the derivative of y with respect to b appears. So these are the sensitivity equations. So y you can see here that they have uh, the form which is quite similar to the original equation and uh, when designing uh, optimal sensor positions you must know you must know, um, uh, you must know uh, uh, the derivative of, uh, you must know the derivative of y with respect to a and the derivative of y with respect to b because they form the vector g here. Uh, how to compute uh, uh, these uh, variables? We solve the original state equation and these two sensitivity equations at the same time. So, in, in, instead of one equ state equation, you have three equations which should be uh, solved simultaneously because here in the sensitivity equations you, you can see uh, the original state equation, uh, state variable y. So, um, so this is the reason why we uh, solve this um, uh, simultaneously. Uh, this variational method uh, makes uh, this a bit easier. Uh, we, using the adjoint approach, uh, we, we solve only one equation, one uh, partial differential equation, but um, this is only some uh, way of circumventing the problem, but the problem comes back because uh, the adjoint equation is sometimes very unstable and uh, hard to compute. So I, I think that in, in case you have uh, two, three, five, several parameters, uh, to be estimated, the sensitivity equation is uh, the best solution. So, we, here you have uh, a general form of uh, the optimality criterion. Uh, here you see the matrix capital Q and uh, a scalar gamma, and depending on the choices of this capital Q and gamma, you, you get uh, some criteria I've uh, talked about, uh, so uh, the, the optimality criterion, uh, the optimality criterion, and so on. So this is, well, one equation which gives you all the criteria depending on the choice gam of gamma and capital, capital Q. Unfortunately, well, it is easy to say, but how to, com how to minimize uh, the optimality criterion uh, based on uh, on uh, this information metric because well it, it may seem that well we have uh, we have uh, the following formula defining the information matrix now we have uh, it depends on uh, the sensor positions now we have we have uh, some criteria. We select one of them, for example, the d optimality criterion. We should maximize it. So well. Now the question reduces to taking the appropriate numerical solver and using the solver. Unfortunately, the question is not that easy. Uh, first of all, uh, we have problems with dimensionality because the number of sensors can be pretty high. So the question is that this optimization process is not uh, that uh, easy to uh, perform. Um, another problem is that well, we used the information matrix, uh, but let's note uh, that in our system, in, in our problem, for example here, 
the state depends on the parameters nonlinearly. Even in, in the equation, you, you, even if you, in the equation you have a linear dependence of the right-hand side of the parameters, the dependence of y on the parameters is, ha, can be highly nonlinear. So I started by the example uh, concerning uh, the pan balance, for example, on measuring uh, resistance. That, uh, yes, and. Uh, the model was linear with respect to the parameters. Here, why, owing to this complicated uh, form of um, the partial differential equation, uh, even in the simple, for the simplest equations, the state depends highly nonlinearly on the parameters theta. So this makes a problem. And we rely on some, on some um, asymptotic results, namely on the so-called kramer rao inequality. This gives you the information, uh, the covariance matrix for the estimate. Well, so this is a measure of dispersion of, of the estimates. But it, is, it gives you something which is uh, no, no, uh, an inequality. So here you observe observe uh, the inverse of the information matrix, but this inequality should be equality if we uh, want to use uh, the inverse of the information matrix. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make any sense. So the gap between the right-hand side and the left-hand side should be at least very low. Uh, how to do it? Uh, basically, we, the, approach, uh, the approach is justified uh, on uh, when we make some assumptions. Well, I if you take a typical paper from this field, the list of assumptions is pretty long, well, uh, at least 10 or so. But uh, I think that uh, basically uh, two are mm, uh, very important. The first of them is that uh, the nonlinearity of the state variable with respect to uh, the parameters should be moderate. So, so how to quantify it? So it's another question. So, but it, it is quite logical. Uh, y depends on theta nonlinearly. But uh, if we want to apply our approach, this dependence, nonlinear dependence, should be as similar to linear dependence as possible. And. Uh, the other assumption is that the noise shouldn't be very high. So uh, the noise should be low. This is also very logical. But uh, what does it mean? Well, this is also a, a, a another question. So if these assumptions are satisfied, well, uh, we can approximate, uh, approximately write here e equality. And then instead of... Uh, the covariance metric for the estimator, uh, which is impossible to compute, we can use the inverse of the information matrix. And you can see here the formula for this information matrix. So, so this is one inconvenience and one critical point in, in uh, experimental design. Well, sensors can uh, tend to cluster. So this is a very, very uh, delicate point. And uh, the solutions usually depend on the parameters. This is another, mm, another point which is very critical. Uh, uh, let me show you uh, why this is so. Let's start by clusterization. Uh, consider the following heat equation. Uh, we assume that the diffusion coefficient uh, has the following form. There are three parameters theta 1, theta 2, theta 3. <laughs> there are some uh, boundary conditions, a uh, constant uh, initial condition. And in this point, if you use a classical solver, you, have, you locate six sensors. The results are a bit surprising. These are the results. If you uh, use uh, this form of the information matrix, if you maximize the determinant of this information matrix, it turns out that two sensors should be placed here, two sensors here, and two sensors here. This means clusterization. And this is a direct uh, consequence of the critical assumption that 
measurements from different sensors are independent. So if they are independent, so this means we can place two sensors at one point. And we place here two sensors at one point. So we have repetitions. We saw the repetitions in one of the examples at the beginning of my lecture today. And here you have the same, uh, the same situation. Uh, so uh, people don't realize uh, this fact, and I, uh, sometimes I uh, read papers where uh, people uh, observe that, well, the locations for measurements are almost at the same uh, places and are not able to uh, um, explain why. So this is the reason, the, the independence, the, the assumed independence of measurements. Uh, of course, I show you I showed you that we can include um, uh, correlations between uh, measurements at different points, and if we use such correlations, uh, so this is not, not the same example but using correlations, you can see that there are six different sensor positions. Of course, they are close to each other, but if, if the correlation is stronger, the distances will be uh, larger. So. Uh, we must uh, take this point into account and to find some trade-off. We have two possibilities. We have independent measurements and uh, when we have independent measurements we have uh, clusterization or we can select a much more complicated approach including correlations between measurements it leads to uh, much to much longer computations. We get the results, but uh, but when expending much more efforts to to get to the solution. But this is not the all. Uh, let's let uh, let me present this example. This is even simpler. So because it concerns uh, the diffusion equation for in one dimension. So th it uh, it is defined on the interval from zero to uh, pi. And uh, well, uh, zero uh, boundary conditions, and uh, there are there is another parameter at um, uh, in the initial conditions. There are two parameters. One is the diffusion coefficient, theta one, and uh, the second parame unknown parameter is uh, present in the, in the initial conditions. So uh, the example is. Uh, very simple, so you, you can get here uh, a closed form of uh, the, the state, so it depends on the parameters, and you, you can see here clearly that y depends linearly on theta, theta 2, but highly non-linearly on theta 1. So I, draw a, I mentioned that y is, depends on non-linear on, on parameters, and you can see here that this is true. Mm, when you, you compute the determinant of the information matrix, it takes the following form. And, um, and uh, here, oh, here you have a term dependent on x, y, and x2. And so this is um, the point where measurements should be taken. It's, well, at the same point, yes? You, you can see here the determinant is maximum at this point when the positions are the same. Uh, quite a, a similar process, this, uh, the same equation but with different initial conditions. And we have the following analytical form of, of the state uh, variable. You can also observe here the, the nonlinear dependence on the diffusion coefficient. Here, there is only one parameter to be, to be estimated. So this means that the information matrix is uh, just a scalar. <laughs> you can compute the scalar. Of course, you can use any computer algebra system to do so. And uh, so you get the following form. If you plot the, mm, the surface, uh, for this expression, for uh, 
let's say, the information metric, but this is not a matrix as scalar. Uh, the, using the determinant doesn't uh, change anything. So uh, the deoptimality criterion is just the expression you get here. So if we plot this expression, you have here the following surface, and we want to use the maximum value of of the determinant. Here, the plot is the following. Here you have uh, uh, the coordinate of the sensor, and here the value of the parameter theta. And you can see here that the maximum uh, of uh, the, the determinant of the information matrix, the maximum of the deoptimality criterion, changes when we change the parameter. So for the parameter uh, which is close to zero, we have something here, and then if we change the parameter, we get here different val a different optimum value of the sensor position. So this is quite uh, it is easy to explain why. You, you, you see here the information matrix, the inverse of the information matrix. It is a basis for our um, approach. Uh, here, the information, information matrix is expressed by the sensitivity coefficients, and the sensitivity coefficients should be computed at the actual value of the parameter to be estimated. So this is the sense of the Kramer-Rau inequality. So this should be the actual value of the, the estimate. Of, of the parameter, but we don't know this value. Uh, we will have some knowledge about this value after performing the experiment. When we have some observations, we uh, minimize the least squares criterion, we have some estimate of uh, the true parameter. But we want to design uh, optimal source of positions before the experiment, so uh, we must uh, substitute something for theta. This should be some um, preliminary uh, estimate, some nominal value for, for theta. Uh, otherwise, it, it is not possible to do so. So you can see that this is uh, a vicious circle. We want to estimate theta in the most accurate manner as possible. But to do so, we must know theta. So this is maybe the most, uh, the, the highest controversy about uh, optimum experimental design. So in order to perform uh, the design, we must, have, we must have some prior knowledge about what theta is. So, in Yes. What happens if your prior is very bad? Well, this is a good point. So <laughs> the problem is that we can use something which is called adaptive design. So we can start from some prior, uh, then, and we can design for this prior, maybe very bad. We perform some experiment, we collect some information about theta, we process this information, and we have an updated value of the parameter. We design the experiment for this updated value. Uh, we perform th the experiment again. We analyze the result again. We update the value and so on. So this procedure of adaptive design is uh, maybe the most direct uh, way of circumventing the problem. Uh, I'll I'm going to talk to you about some alternative approaches in the second part of my talk, well, because I see that well, it's almost, yes, we have a half an hour break. Uh, so, but, but this is a, a very uh, delicate problem, as you can see, and well, there are no good solutions. Of course, one question is, in, under what conditions the whole procedure converges? So this is not that easy. Uh, it turns out that uh, the simplest condition to guarantee con uh, convergence is that in all computations, you should use information collected from all the stages from the beginning, not from the last stage, but from all the stages 
from the beginning. Uh, so uh, you include all the observations. So this, this uh, leads to the convergence of the procedure under some additional uh, restrictions, of course. Okay. Okay. So we finished by uh, some comments on adaptive design. Uh, so this is a, a way to avoid problems with the dependence on the design on the actual value of the parameter which you want to identify. Uh, so this is uh, the most critical problem with the design for uh, dynamic systems. But all people uh, studying the problem agree that this problem is, uh, can be avoided. So we must live with it. And practically in all uh, works on this um, problem, uh, people either assume some arbitra arbitrarily selected value uh, of the parameter, which is an approximation to the actual value of the estimated parameter, or use adaptive design, or they can use some pseudo-Bayesian approaches. I'm, I just give a few words about it in uh, the last part of my talk. So, uh, well, uh, frankly speaking, uh, as you can see, uh, the number of slides is quite high, but this is only the first part of my, <laughs> my slides. Uh, so uh, I, uh, in, in the, during the break, um, I had to decide what to do next, what, what to present next. But I think we'll continue with uh, local optimal, de optimal designs. Uh, this is because I think uh, in this way you, you will get the flavor, flavor of uh, uh, optimum experimental design not only related to partial differential equations but in general uh, to, to all other systems. So uh, you will uh, get the idea of um, approximate designs so which is uh, uh, the currently which is the most often used uh, tool in optimal experimental design. In the context of distributed parameter systems, it was introduced by Rafael Wobich in the 1980s. So let's assume that we have a number of candidate positions for placing sensors. Uh, this, these positions are fixed, so you select them arbitrarily or you can draw them at random. So anyway, you have a number of fixed positions. This, this number is finite. The question is that we can locate, uh, we want to locate sensors at the points. And this is very delicate. We assume that we can locate several sensors at one point. For an engineer, this is not logical, but I've already explained to you where uh, this comes from. If you, we assume that uh, the measurements are independent of one another, well, we can place several sensors at one point, even though an engineer says it doesn't make sense. In what follows, I'll try to justify that it makes sense, not literally, but we can interpret the results in a way which is very useful even for engineers. So let's uh, keep uh, our intuition that uh, it is impossible to place several sensors at one point. But let's keep it away and uh, assume for a while that it is possible. So the number of sensors placed at one point will be denoted by Ri. Uh, so uh, the total number of observations is capital N. So uh, this is uh, the equation for observations. Oh, I'm looking for my pointer. Oh, here, here. <coughs> here uh, 
here you can you can see uh, repetitions. So at a given point indexed by i, you have the additional index j, which indexes uh, repeated observations at uh, the same point. We have uh, j, which uh, is related to a given uh, census at, at uh, this point. So j, j changes in the range from 1 to ri. So the information matrix takes the following form. Uh, the repetitions are uh, included here. So here you, you can find uh, the coordinates of a given point and here the repetitions at a given point. So the contributions from a given point are uh, like this and they are multiplied by the number of sensors placed at this point. If you don't agree with this interpretation that we can place several sensors at one point, you can interpret this like statisticians uh, interpret uh, this during presentations at conferences and at seminars. They assume that instead of placing several sensors at one point, we can repeat the experiment several times. So you can place one sensor at, at one point and uh, Ri denotes the, the number of repetitions of this experiment and uh, the, the same sensor make, uh, makes measurement, takes measurements Ri times. So the repetitions are independent of one another. Of course, a practitioner will say that it doesn't make uh, uh, sense to, it doesn't make sense either because, well, it's hard to um, uh, repeat the experiment for such complicated uh, processes in the same conditions. And it takes a lot of time, it costs a lot of money, but anyway, at least it is, uh, it is conceptually uh, plausible. Mm. Well, we want to minimize some measure denoted by psi uh, de de defined on the information matrix. For example, for the de-optimality criterion, we want to minimize the log debt of uh, the inverse of the information matrix, or we can uh, minimize the trace of the inverse. And now the notion of the design appears. So any statistician involved in experimental design uses the notion of the design of the experiment, and he or she interprets this in the following terms. It is a table denoted here by Xi. It is the most common uh, the most common um, symbol used in this context. And it is a table. Uh, the first row of this table uh, uh, defines the points, the different points where the measurement, measurements can be taken. And the uh, bottom row denotes uh, the so-called weights. Uh, normally, you could write here the number of sensors placed at a given point. So here you, you could write Ri, R1, and here you could write RL. But for, you can normalize the, these weights and uh, you can divide all of them by the total number of sensors. In this way, here you can have the proportion of the total number of sensors placed at point X1. Here you can find the proportion of the total number of sensors placed at point, at point XL. So uh, this definition implies that these weights are multiplicities of the reciprocal of the total number of sensors. And they are non-negative and they sum up to unity. So, uh, in terms of statistics, this defines a discrete probability distribution. So, you can interpret the sensor locations as uh, potential values of, uh, mm, uh, of a discrete uh, random variable, and here you can find, you can interpret the weights as uh, the probabilities of, of uh, these values. But this is not uh, important from, for, for our. Uh, optimization problem. Uh, this way of presenting the problem doesn't change its nature because 
irrespective of the interpretation, we, in fact, deal with a combinatorial problem. We have a finite number of points, and we want to put a given number of sensors at these points. We want to distribute them. The number of possibilities is finite. It's huge, but it's finite. So we have a discrete optimization problem, which is hard to solve in practice, which can be very hard to, to, to be solved in practice. And the idea, having its origins at the beginning of the 1970s, was to relax this problem. Instead of taking weights which are multiplicities of uh, the reciprocal of the number of sensors, uh, we can relax uh, these weights and assume that they are any real values which sum up to unity and are non-negative. So this leads to the so-called uh, approximate designs. This is the most common tool used in optimum or experimental design uh, in the case of, well, sensor selection, or even more often in the case of uh, uh, input uh, design, in the case of, uh, well, um, uh, clinical trials and so on. Well, where, when you go to conferences uh, for people for experimental design, well, they use this stuff as something quite normal. So we will operate on weights. We will find uh, the values of, of weights, uh, which are reals, which sum up to unity and are non-negative. That is to say, we operate on um, the values from the canonical or from a probability simplex. So uh, what, why is this so? Uh, well, we have the following problem. We minimize uh, a criterion defined on the information matrix. Uh, the information matrix is expressed in this way, and here the weights are our decision variables, our optimization variables. Here you have element, we, you have matrices which can be computed a priori. You have here the formula for producing uh, these matrices. They are based on the sensitivi sensitivity coefficients. You can compute the sensitivity coefficients before the computations, you can store them, you can form from them uh, these matrices. This means when you optimize the weights, these matrices are known. They can be stored in computer memory, and each of the matrices is related to one special point, one candidate point, one candidate point where measurements can be taken. The unknowns are uh, the weights PI. Well, uh, why is this so? Uh, first of all, the problem is, uh, has a very nice structure. Uh, you can compute for, this, for any criterion used in practice, for the optimality criterion, for the A-optimality criterion, and so on, you can compute the derivatives with respect to the matrix. Uh, so uh, this means that we can compute a matrix which collects the derivatives of the criterion with respect to individual elements of the information matrix. Uh, well, and the, this is not that hard. And for example, for the D-optimality criterion, you can compute this uh, matrix of derivatives. And this is just the inverse of the information matrix transpose, transposed. Uh, and you can hear the negative. The information matrix is symmetric, so this transposition is, in fact, not needed here. Uh, the, for the, the A-optimality criterion, this der derivative is also very easy to compute. So, one of the reasons for the whole stuff is that well, the related uh, derivatives can be very easily computed. Then the following quantities uh, can be computed for any spa spatial distribution of the sensors, for, for any design. We can compute the following scalar. And for each of the criteria we 
we can use here. Uh, this is uh, this uh, scalar say can C can be computed uh, very easily, and when you substitute uh, the derivatives, uh, I shown uh, in the last slide uh, here, and uh, after some algebra for the d optimality criterion, it turns out that this scalar is just the number of parameters which are unknown. You estimate, for example, three parameters, so this means that this coefficient is three. For the A optimality criterion, this is a bit more complicated because you must compute the inverse of the information matrix and then you must compute the trace. But these operations are very easy to program, very easy to, to, to use. As for this function phi, it de de depends on the point x and on the given design. It, it, it can be also computed, this is spe a specific function, uh, which de depends on x, you can see here that it depends on the, uh, the you can find here the sensitivity coefficients, they defend, depend on the special variable and they depend on time. I mentioned to you a little bit about uh, the uh, direct differentiation method which uh, serves to use, uh, to, to compute uh, the sensitivity coefficients. You must, for a given design, you can compute uh, the information matrix, you invert, invert uh, them, you invert it and multiply, multiply it by itself. So these quantities are very easy to compute. Why to compute them? Because then we have the problem which is a convex optimization problem. And any time when we deal with convex optimization problems, the first idea we come, which comes to our mind is that uh, there, are, there are a lot of computational procedures which makes the computation, uh, the solution of such problems easy. And, um, uh, and even more, the computation, computation, the efficient computation is, even, is possible even for a large number of decision variables. So everything is easier when we deal with uh, convex optimization. And, uh, Many people in the 1970s uh, which were who were concerned with optimum experimental design realized that it was possible to uh, use some methods, it was possible to implant some methods from, optim uh, from uh, convex optimization to solve problems of uh, optimum experimental design. What does it give in some, some uh, I mean specificity? First of all, we can show that an optimum design, an optimal solution uh, uh, exists. This is not uh, difficult, but we can give um, a number of support points. What, mean, what does the notion of support points mean? I defined the design uh, as a table in which you have candidate points and uh, with each of these points, you associate the corresponding weight. The, the weight means the proportion of the total number of measurements, uh, the, the proportion of the total number of sensors placed at this point. Some of the weights can be zero, some, some can be non-zero. The support points are the candidate points at which the weights are non-zero. So the result here means that the number of candidate points at which in the optimum, so, uh, in, in the optimum solution the number of uh, uh, sensors will be non-zero, it can be bounded from above by the following limit. So we, we can deduce uh, w which is the number of uh, candidate points where the sensors uh, can be placed. What is more, we can formulate uh, the so-called equivalence theorem. Equivalence theorem it is another um, notion used by statisticians, uh, which uh, denotes, which uh, is, is a criterion uh, which makes it uh, makes it possible to decide whether a given design is optimal or not. So these optimal conditions, when our problem 
is convex, are uh, necessary and sufficient at the same time. So let's assume that we have a set of candidate points, we have a gi a given weights associated with these points, and uh, it is possible then to check whether or not it is an optimal design. If the, at least one of these conditions is satisfied, this means, well, we have an optimum design, we have an optimum solution. So the three conditions are equivalent, so in practice it is easy to, it, it is uh, sufficient to uh, check only uh, one of them. I will show you in a while how to check it in practice because it is very, very uh, elegant. Mm. For, for the de-optimality criterion, uh, so this is, uh, this is a, the equivalence the theorem. The problem is that it is useful when we have a given design and we want to check whether or not is it, is it, it is optimal. But the problem is how to construct such designs. Uh, in the history of optimum experimental design, um, several algorithms were uh, invented in order to construct uh, optimum design, in order to produce uh, the solution to this relaxed problem. And uh, for the de-optimality, you can uh, encounter the following algorithm. This is a so-called multiplicative algorithm. It is invented by Ben Torsney. Uh, uh, he worked in, in Glasgow for all his uh, life and now he's retired. And uh, it's, it's uh, his best achievement, I think. Most people use this multiplicative algorithm due to its simplicity. Why, uh, how, how it, uh, does it work? We guess init initial, uh, initial weights. Uh, the algorithm will converge uh, in any time. It would converge uh, irrespective of the initial set of weights maybe uh, longer or shorter, uh, but uh, it, it will converge. So basically, in practical implementation, we set these weights uh, as equal to one another. Uh, in most often, we set these weights as equal to one another and, st and then start uh, the, the algorithm. The problem is, uh, the, the main assumption here is that the weights for all candidate points should be non-zero. When you do it, then the next step is to check the optimality conditions. Well, I, I will show uh, the interpretation of, of the optimality conditions in, in a moment, so you will see how to uh, interpret them. And uh, then, if we don't have an optimal solution, then we pass to the update of the weights. And y you can see here the reason why this algorithm uh, is called uh, the multiplicative algorithm. Mm, the new weights are the old weights multiplied by this function phi, which were defined previously. Oh. Here you can, this function phi, so it's uh, relatively easy to, to, to compute. Divided by the number of parameters. So, uh, you multiplied the old weights by some, up, uh, some uh, current value of, of this quantity, and you have the updated value of the parameters. The, the algorithm is very easy to implement. It's several lines of code. So, and, and it, well, it's maybe it's not the fastest algorithm for, for solve uh, this kind of problems, uh, but certainly it's uh, the, the simplest algorithm to implement. So it's always convergent. It's reminiscent uh, to the EM algorithm. So if you know the EM algorithm, it's, it's al an algorithm in, in statistics which is uh, always convergent, but maybe not, not uh, the, the fastest. Uh, the computations can, be, can, be, can take some time. Uh, but here, e even for a, a large number of parameters, well, this algorithm works very nice, even if you have thousands of can candidate uh, sensor positions. Well, it, it, it is very uh, easy to implement, and it's, uh, it requires uh, uh, low storage. 
So it doesn't operate on um, Hessians and so on. Well, uh, so, so it's, it, it works quite nice. Um, in order to show you how to interpret the results obtained by this algorithm, uh, let's consider the following example. We have here two parameters in the, in the uh, partial differential equation, A, B, and one parameter in the initial condition. Uh, so, uh, in the initial condition, uh, you can find also uh, this uh, function psi, which is well, a combination of some sine functions. Mm. So, you have uh, 21 uh, candidate points. Uh, they are uh, arranged in the interval from 0 to 1. And after uh, the termination of the multiplicative algorithm, you, you can see here that the number of points where measurements uh, should be taken is equal to 3. There are three parameters, parameters to be estimated and there are only three points where measurements uh, ca can be taken. So when you have a given number of sensors, well, at, at uh, about a quarter of them should be placed in the center of the interval and um, uh, one, third, uh, one third should be about one, uh, more than one third should be placed up to the point uh, 0 0.2 and one third should be point at point 0 0.8. And here you have the interpretation of uh, the optimality conditions. You have here the plot of the function psi. Uh, at each point you can compute the value of uh, this function and uh, you can see here why uh, the, the optimality conditions are satisfied. Y you here trace uh, the line at uh, the level of 3, the number of parameters, and you recognize that you get uh, the optimal solution because this function psi doesn't exceed the number of parameters. So this is uh, very easy to interpret, so very, very easy to check. The, the function psi uh, doesn't exceed the number of parameters. This is for the d-optimality criterion. If at least one, for one point this function exceeds uh, this line, exceeds this, uh, the number of parameters, this means that you don't have uh, an optimal solution. Oh, here you can also see that the multiplicative algorithm uh, produces an increasing sequence of uh, va the value of the determinant. Uh, of course, the iterations are discrete, but I joined uh, uh, the points, so it produces a continuous line, a bit art artificially, but you can see that the values of the determinants uh, increase. Um, this is a first order algorithm which means that uh, it doesn't exploit, uh, exploit information about uh, the second derivatives uh, with respect to weights and uh, it, is, uh, it is relatively uh, fast at the beginning but when we uh, move closer to the optimum uh, the changes in the determinant are slower and slower. Here you have maybe a much more applicable example. We have uh, the problem of material flow detection in uh, the following uh, block uh, made of metal. We, place this, we can place the sensors at, uh, on the boundary of, uh, of this block. And you have here the candidate points. Well, here you have the description. Mm, the, unknown, uh, the parameters, the unknown parameters are uh, included in the uh, conductivity coefficient and here you have optimal weights. The problem is symmetrical so you can instead of this point you can equivalently place uh, um, uh, the same number of sensors at the opposite point or you can split uh, the sensors put, put at this point at, at the two points, this, this point and this, that point and the, that point. Uh, he, you can see here that uh, this is the case of A optimality, this is the case of D optimality and the solution solutions are different. So uh, sometimes uh, 
the, the obtained solutions uh, strongly depend on the kind of criteria on which you use. Summarizing, <coughs> let's come back to the question whether or not it's sensible. I think this is sensible anyway, in spite of the fact that we can't place uh, several sensors at the same point, because using this approach, which is computational, very easy, uh, we can identify, we can indicate special regions which provide the most important inf information about the parameters. Uh, and we can quantify um, this in influence in, in this way. So it can be some preliminary stage for more advanced uh, design methods. So we start with this very simple idea just to locate the most valuable uh, um, subdomains in, in our special region where measurements can be taken. Um, well, as Professor Rafaiwovich told me once, well, but it is possible to put two sensors at one point. I was very surprised why to do so, uh, how to do it. Well, it's shown, well, let's imagine this is a plate and this is an optimum point. So we can place one sensor here and the other sensors, sensor here. Well, we can interpret it, interpret it this in this way, but I'm not convinced very much about uh, um, uh, the generality of this approach. But <coughs> instead of several sensors placed at one point, we can use a more precise measurement device at that point. If a, a weight is high, this means that this point is very critical for the precision of the estimates. And instead of several sensors put at one point, you can use a ma more accurate device. And how more accurate? It is quantified by the inverse of the weight. So uh, the weights are not that useless here. So, so it, is, it is a very, very nice interpretation. And uh, equivalently, uh, you can, uh, instead of is placing several sensors at one point, you can take uh, measurements at a given point much more frequently. I saw several uh, works in robotics where the authors uh, used a mobile robot to locate something and, uh, well, uh, the frequency of uh, the measurements were uh, stem from uh, the computation of the weights. So it is not that uh, uh, useless as, as it may seem. Uh, finally, and I think <laughs> that statisticians don't even uh, um, thought about it, didn't even thought, uh, think about it, uh, that the, their algorithms can be used in the context, in the broader context of sensor selections, because the methods I've talked to you about with the relaxation, with uh, the multiplicative algorithm, can be used to, in order to find uh, specific sensor positions. We can attack the, the original problem of combinatorial um, optimization of selecting sites for uh, se uh, um, placing sensors uh, using the algorithms I've just talked you about, but as, a compo as components of more general computational schemes. And I'm going to show you this in uh, the remainder of my talk. So the result that you obtained before with just three sensors selected were selected, obtained under this hypothesis or without this hypothesis? There was a, uh, with the three positions and zero weights on the other point. Yes, yes, yes. But, uh, but uh, well, all, all points, at the beginning, all points were equ equivalent. So, at, we started uh, computations by um, uh, e equal weights. So, uh, the starting solution was that the weights are equal everywhere. Then we ran uh, uh, the multiplicative algorithms, and here the weights are not almost zero. Well, because well, it's a dynamic process, and well, you multiply the weights by this update, and you, you get new weights. So for the points where you, you see zero, uh, the weights are decreasing, and well, they're almost zero. So practically, they are zero. 
the number of non-zero weights is given by the result here. We know uh, the upper bound uh, on the number of non-zero weights. But uh, this, uh, only sh it, it is only useful uh, as something which shows that the number, this number is finite. But uh, this number can be pretty high when you have 10 uh, parameters. This means that uh, the number of points is, uh, uh, is uh, 60. 55. Because, uh, well, mm, it, it's, uh, it, well, here you, you, you get the situation when as for example here, one fourth of the total number of sensors should be placed here at one point. This means that this point is more valuable than the other points. Well, uh, even if you repeat the measurements, so it, it gives you much more information about uh, the parameters uh, than the other points. <laughs> Let's recall uh, the example from the beginning. We uh, wanted to um, determine points at which uh, to uh, measure here. We want to uh, estimate the resistance and uh, we want to uh, determine the values of the current at which uh, we, we measure the voltages. And uh, here we had a similar situation. We had two points and we repeat measurements at these points. So the other points in the middle of the interval are not that uh, valuable at, as the points are at uh, the, uh, the boundary of the design region. But of course, um, this doesn't mean that uh, this is all what we can invent uh, regarding, uh, regarding uh, sensor selection. Uh, well, just, just uh, a few words about uh, possible extension. Uh, one idea which comes to our mind is that instead of uh, optimizing weights, we can on also optimize the position, positions of the points. And uh, additionally, we can optimize uh, the number of the points. Though, so uh, this can be also done, but I don't, I, I'm not going to go into details. Uh, the question is that instead of the designs uh, of the type I uh, um, discussed uh, a couple of minutes ago, then I pass to designs uh, which are considered as probability, any probability measures defined on a design region. So the problem becomes a bit complicated uh, from um, if you want to afford it as engineers, but well, anyway, it's possible. It, it's, uh, the results are very tangible. Uh, well, here you can see that we can pass to any probability measures, but after some studies, we can show that, uh, well, instead of uh, dealing with all probability measures, measures, we can restrict our attention to discrete probability measures, discrete designs, and what is more, any design of this type uh, can be uh, concentrated at, at most uh, this number of support points. So we can still remain in the framework, framework of discrete design, discrete probability measures. Uh, so the designs uh, can be 
considered of this type. Uh, the only difference is that the number of candidate points changes, and we optimize these points too. So uh, the results are pretty the same. For example, we can derive optimality conditions. And for the de-optimality criterion, we have here an example of with three parameters. The design region is from one to minus one to one. This is the space variable. Uh, we can place sensors um, at any point from minus one to one. And the results are like here. So you have uh, the function phi. This is the derivative function. Uh, I mentioned about it uh, a couple of minutes ago. And we recognize that we have an optimal design because the value of this function doesn't exceed the value 3, which is the number of parameters. Y you can see here that it doesn't exceed the value. Uh, for comparison, you can, hear, uh, you, you can see here the dashed line. And the dashed, for the dashed line, the same function exceeds the number of parameters. And you recognize that uh, the design uh, for this line is not optimal, because the values of, of um, this function exceed the number of parameters. What is more, uh, at uh, the support points where the values, uh, where the weights are non-zero, uh, the values of this function are exactly three. So this is also something which is very useful. Uh, recently, I've been concerned with the problem of uh, selecting op an optimum number of points. So uh, this is a very uh, active research area. Uh, and uh, the problem is, uh, for le let's compute an optimum sensor location. Uh, we have some optimum value of the de-optimality criterion, and it corresponds to a given location of sensors. The question is whether or not we can achieve the same value of the optimality criterion, but for a lower number of sensor locations. And uh, how to do it? So uh, people um, use something uh, like a sparsity measure, so uh, you have, apart from the de-optimality criterion, uh, they d d add here something which uh, is a function uh, which defines, which measure the sparsity of the solution. It's which measure the number of sensors which uh, are used. And uh, so, uh, minimization, maximization, uh, the ma minimization maximization approach, which is the most useful uh, tool, tool here. Uh, so you can, uh, you can read many papers uh, regarding the choice of this measure of sparsity, the measure uh, of uh, the number of uh, um, points where weights are non-zero. Uh, so uh, the problem is a bit hard here because this function is uh, convex and this function is most, uh, most often uh, concave. So you minimize the sum of a, a con convex function and a concave function. Uh, alternatively, you can express it as the difference uh, as uh, the difference of a convex function, and here you have the minus. Uh, here you have minus. This function minus psi is convex, so you have a difference of convex function. So this is a usual framework of the so-called uh, DC optimization. So this uh, uh, this is a topic for which several algorithms exist. Basically, they reduce to a sequence of uh, convex uh, problems in which you linearize this term. But um, the problem, the real problem here, is that you, in this way, uh, you get only a local solution. So you can have a solution which is far from uh, optimal in respect of uh, sparse solution. Um, what you can do here in, in order to uh, do it properly, uh, you can find at first 
at the optimal solution. For this solution, you have a given information matrix. Then you can, you can minimize this function. You can minimize this function is subject to the constraint that uh, the information matrix is the same. So you don't want, don't want to change the optimal information matrix. You only want to change the weights uh, in such a way so this uh, criterion measuring, measuring the sparsity of solutions is the lowest. And the problem here is that you, you have uh, this function is uh, a concave and you minimize a concave function. So the problem is NP-hard. Minimization of a, com uh, of a concave function is completely different from a maximization of a con concave function. Maximization of a concave function is, is relatively easy, let's say. As for minimization of a concave function, it is always achieved uh, at, um, at, at, on the boundary when your uh, design region is a, mm, uh, is a, a polytop, as, as is the usually, usually the case, you obtain a solution at a vertex of this polytop. And the number of vertices uh, grows ex exponentially with the number of sensors. Well, so I try to attack this problem using some branch and bound approach and, and so uh, something which is uh, especially suited for minimization of uh, concave functions or maximization of uh, mm, convex functions. Uh, the topic was very popular in the 1990s. Uh, I tried several approaches. Well, it is extremely slow. The solutions are not that mm, uh, spectacular. So I don't think this line of research is so, uh, so useful. Well, people, th you, you can observe this in many papers, but uh, the specification is a very hot topic. But in the context of sensor selection, I, I'm a bit skeptical about the usefulness of, of these results. OK. Maybe two problems, two more problems, uh, well, uh, they can be called some advanced problems. But in the first one, I'd like to uh, show you how the multiplicative algorithm, the stuff r related to convex optimization can be uh, used in order to solve, to attack uh, the combinatorial problems, uh, which are related to uh, specific uh, selection of points where we want to Point, we want to select. Uh, we want to place one sensor at one point, not several sensors at one point, but uh, several. Uh, but one point, uh, one sensor at one point. So l let's uh, consider scanning. This means that we have a given number of uh, spatial points, and we want to split the observation horizon into a number of uh, sub-intervals and the position of positions of active sensors change during time. So we don't, u don't select all, uh, we, we don't use all uh, the available sensors, but at, at each uh, time sub-interval, over each time sub-interval, we select uh, maybe a, a, a different uh, subset of uh, sensors which will actually take measurements. The other sensors will remain dormant. Uh, the reason for not using all the available sensors could be the reduction of the overall system, uh, sensor, uh, of the overall system complexity and uh, the cost of operation and maintenance. Um, 
But to start with, let's consider the case that we have only stationary uh, sensors, so only one, uh, one uh, uh, interval, time interval. Uh, when we, um, when I, sh well, I show you uh, how to uh, select uh, sensors here, we, we will come back to the case of um, scanning uh, observations. So uh, we have some nodes. This no number of nodes is finite, and we want to find an optimum subset of, of active sensors. For the least square criterion here, uh, we, we can introduce here flags. Uh, these are coefficients uh, which are 1 if a given sensor is active, 0 if a given sensor is dormant. So this criterion, which uh, will be minimized, uh, in, uh, includes only the terms for, for which uh, the sensors are active. So this is very logical. So we have some flags, some uh, indicator variables. We can call it w one way or, or another. The i are defined um, whether or not a given sensor is active. These are binary variables. So the problem is like here for the d optimality criterion. Uh, we want to find optimal weights. Uh, optimal uh, variables vi, so as to maximize the log determinant of, of this matrix. And the constraints seem to be very simple. So the sum of weights is the number of uh, total number of uh, sensors, and the weights are 0 or 1. Well, this seems simple, but it is not easy to, to solve. Um, because it is a highly computational, a highly combinatorial problem. And one way of seeking a solution can be um, a reformulation of the problem. Instead of seeking an optimum uh, configuration of activated sensors, we can reduce the problem dimensionality by looking for an optimal density of sensors, or density of active sensors. So uh, this make, uh, makes the problem easier and it will make possible to use all the stuff I've, I've just uh, talked to you about uh, using, uh, using approximate design and so on. So uh, an, uh, a way to circ circumvent the combinatorial um, nature of, of the optimization problem is to uh, operate on optimum, uh, or on, is operate on special density of sensors in, instead of uh, sensor, loca sensor locations. Mathematically, we can identify a density of sensors with a probability measure on the special region where, where the, the observations can be uh, taken. This makes the pro everything a bit abstract, but this is not that abstract. When we assume that we have uh, such a measure, how can we interpret it in practice? Uh, we can divide Partition, we can partition the region where the measurements can be taken into smaller regions. Such a partition is something natural when we use the final element method, for example. And at each region, we locate the number of sensors, which is uh, the following. Uh, this is the total number of sensors. We uh, multiply it by the measure of a given subregion, and uh, we uh, uh, round it up so the number of sensors at a given subregion can be computed in this way. Of course, this is only an approximation, and uh, uh, the question remains how to uh, locate, uh, how to activate uh, specific sensors in a given, um, given uh, subregion when we have already have this number, but this is a, a different problem. In, in this approach, this is for the case when we have thousands of possible sensor positions, uh, it, it, it gives something concrete. At least we know uh, how many sensors can be associated with given, given uh, subregions. 
So uh, the, in order to complete the formulation, uh, we should introduce a maximal possible number of sensors, a maxim, maximum possible sensor density. This is represented by, here by uh, a probability measure uh, omega. So this probability measure is, is uh, mo most often represented by uh, uh, density uh, rho. So this can be in interpreted as a maximal density uh, of special density of active sensors. Some optimality conditions uh, can be uh, formulated here. Mm, they are a bit more complicated to interpret uh, as uh, in the case uh, discussed a couple of minutes ago, but uh, this can be also illustrated in a way. Uh, uh, roughly speaking, uh, our function, derivative function phi, uh, at the points at which uh, the density is non-zero, the density is non-zero, should be higher than at the points at which the density is non-zero, is, is zero. So. Uh, you, have some, you obtain something like bang-bang uh, uh, controls in uh, optimal control. Uh, here you can find um, a measure, an optimal measure, which is, uh, uh, which is equal to the maximal uh, allowable sensor density, uh, or is zero. No, nothing is in between. So it is either maximally, uh, uh, either the measure it takes uh, either a maximum value or zero. And uh, there are some uh, optimality conditions which can be checked. Believe me, it's very easy to check uh, these conditions. Uh, so um, everything can be computed easily. The question is, again, we, we, have, we have here um, a tool to check whether or not we have optimality. But the question is how to compute uh, the optimal measure. So we can do it uh, in the following way. Uh, if we introduce the partition, if we have uh, a special region where sensors can be activated, we partition it into smaller subregions. And for, uh, for each subregion, we can define uh, our measure, uh, we can define the value of our unknown optimal measure, xi. Uh, it, it can be denoted by PI. So these PIs can be interpreted as, as our um, decision variables. So uh, if we, our partition includes n sub-regions, we have n weights. And uh, the number of weights is equal to the number of uh, uh, subregions. And uh, here you, you obtain uh, the following uh, form of the final form of the optimization problem. We maximize the log determinant of the information matrix. The information matrix is expressed uh, as a convex combination of uh, some individual uh, matrices related to each subregion. And uh, PIs are, uh, satisfy the following, uh, the following two constraints. Uh, they must sum up to unity, and these uh, uh, weights shouldn't uh, exceed some maximum values B. The, these values B are, uh, can be computed from the maximum allowable density of sensors. So, the difference with respect to the multiplicative algorithms here is that we have an additional constraint of this type. So without this constraint, this problem could be solved using the multiplicative algorithm. This constraint, very easy, very simple, changes everything. We, we should invent another algorithm, but we can do it very uh, relatively easy. There is a nice algorithm, which is called simplicial decomposition. Uh, it was used, it was invented in 1970s, but it, it, since uh, then it's been used uh, in many contexts, uh, especially in the telecommunications. Um, and 
it seems to me that it hasn't been used uh, in statistics. So I presented it in several, at several uh, uh, um, conferences and so on. So well, uh, it seems to be something new in this community. Uh, although it's very interesting in the sense that it includes the multiplicative algorithm as one of its components. Uh, it alternates by solving two uh, simple problems. Uh, one of the problems is a linear programming problem, which is very easy to, to, to solve. Uh, and the second problem is the so-called uh, restricted master problem, which finds uh, the maximum of the objective function of, over the convex, convex hull of previously find extreme points. And this is where the multiplicative algorithm can be, can be used. Let me show you the idea of this algorithm. So uh, you have here a function which can be, the, the, you, have share, you have here contour lines for the function which should be maximized. The maximum is here, but you are constrained to, to this uh, square. This is the initial solution. Uh, in, uh, selected arbitrarily, you compute the gradient at this point, and then you find a vertex point which is the furthest from the initial point in the direction of the gradient. So this is this point. If you go in this direction, the furthest point in this direction is that vertex. And uh, this point is fine uh, by solving the linear programming problem. Uh, you can use the simplex method, but uh, I will show you that the even the simplex method is not necessarily uh, here, so you, you can uh, solve this uh, much easier. Then you have two points. You rest restrict your attention to the convex hull of this, these points. You look for an optimum value of this function over the convex hull over this line. The optimum value of this function is here. Then you compute the gradient at this new point. Uh, you compute, uh, by solving a linear programming problem, the furthest point from this new update, uh, the furthest uh, extreme point along the gradient direction. And then you optimize uh, the original nonlinear function over this uh, convex hull of, of the previous uh, points. The optimum point is here. It is, and when you compute the gradient, it is impossible to improve the solution, so you stop. Uh, you can see uh, the advantage of this procedure. The, at the beginning, there were four points, four vertex, point, four vertex points. And instead of uh, four vertex points, here we checked only two vertex points plus the initial point. There is a small advantage, uh, one point less. Uh, in practice, uh, you may have thousands of uh, mm, decision variables. And simplicial decomposition uh, makes it possible to uh, operate on the regions like this green one, with, where the number of vertex points is about 20, 30, by some orders lower than for the original problem. So um, the line linear problem, which can be solved here, uh, is, uh, can be solved basically by several lines of code. Uh, you just select uh, maximum values uh, of the gradient. And uh, so it's very easy to implement. As for the second uh, sub-problem, which is solved here, you, you have a number of points uh, you optimize over uh, the convex hull of those points. This can be formulated in this way. It is ideally the case where the multiplicative algorithm can be used. So summarizing. Uh, you can plug in the methods which have existed in uh, optimal experimental design for years. In the, this new setting, uh, at practically no cost. 
So it, it, uh, the, the methods uh, like uh, the multiplicative algorithm uh, work without any change, almost without any changes. We are here solving some, some linear programming problem, but it, it makes it possible uh, to um, elevate the complexity of the problem, uh, opera problems we, we use, to a much higher level. Finally, let me briefly mention how to attack uh, the initial uh, uh, scanning, the problem of scanning observations. So instead of one uh, time interval, we have three time intervals, how to do it. So the difference here is that we have, instead of one additional constraint, constraint regarding the weights from below and from above, we have as many constraints as uh, the number of uh, in sub time sub, uh, sub intervals. Uh, what is the difference? We can use block coordinate ascent method. So we can uh, optimize uh, the weights for the first uh, stage, then we pass, we optimize the weights with respect to uh, the second, uh, the weights of the second stage, then we pass to uh, the weights from the third stage, and so on, then we repeat and it's, it, it is repeated until uh, some uh, convergence criterion is uh, satisfied. So uh, using scanning uh, observations doesn't co complicate uh, anything. We can use block, the block coordinate ascent method. So here you can find some example where the optimal, uh, the, where uh, the maximal density of sensors is expressed by the following way. In, in practice, this means that we want to cover at most one quarter, at approximately one quarter of the total area. So uh, for this uh, equation, we have uh, three sub-intervals. So during the first sub-interval, we measure ah, this is for stationary sensors, and this is for scanning sensors, too. this is a mistake on the description. This is for stationary sensors. So as we can see, the, in the optimal solution, uh, one fourth of uh, the area is covered by active sensors. When we use scanning, it is, uh, the total horizon is partitioned in three sub-intervals. This is uh, the optimal uh, active uh, uh, subdomains during the first uh, stage, during the second stage, the four, uh, third stage, the fourth stage, five, fifth stage. Uh, I don't have time uh, to uh, describe uh, the next problem, <coughs> but uh, I will sh on only mention it. Mm. The question uh, uh, here, uh, we operated on uh, sensor densities, on, on the densities of active sensors. Uh, but we can attack the problem directly. We have we have a given number of candidate points. Uh, let's consider a scanning stage, six stages, and we want to select best uh, 10 points of out of uh, 900. So here you, you can see uh, optimal, the optimal locations for the stages. How to do it? Basically, the tool here is the branch and bound method. Uh, the tool which is rarely used in statistics um, this is uh, quite normal for people concerned with computer science. This is uh, normal for people from uh, the, the engineering com community. And um, basically, we can use the branch and bound method uh, in order not to uh, in order not to check all the possible uh, sensor configurations. So we construct the so-called branch and bound tree, uh, which uh, mm, embodies all, which makes it possible to construct all the possible solutions. But 
uh, we can avoid checking all the possible solutions. Uh, normally, the number of possible solutions can be quite high. But at each node, we can uh, have an oracle. We can construct an oracle, which uh, gives us a hint whether or not it is uh, worthy to uh, expand a, a given node. Uh, so uh, if this oracle is uh, properly constructed, we can save m much, uh, much time and we can uh, uh, make computation economic. We can avoid checking all the possible solutions. And sometimes, instead of looking for all possible solutions wi which uh, e exceeds our, our time, our uh, time for computations, we uh, can reduce in this way um, our attention only to the most valuable potential solutions. And this oracle is just the simplicial decomposition I've just uh, mentioned to you. So I don't have time to give you more details, but uh, I've written uh, a paper with my uh, colleague Machi Patan on it, and um, I think it is, it is, well, it was highly cited, cited so, uh, well, it's... Um, it, it describes the whole procedure uh, very in, in, in detail. So, so well, I think it's, it's not included in the book, but, uh, well, it was published in 2007, as far as I remember. So it is, it is, very, it is quite possible to, to, to use it. It is just another example of using classical uh, algorithms of optimum experimental design because the multiplicative algorithm is just a co of the component uh, which uh, makes it possible to uh, uh, economize uh, computation ba computations based on uh, the branch and bound method. Okay. Well. Well, let's, let me uh, pass to the last part of my talk. Unfortunately, I don't have time to uh, discuss uh, mobile observations. It requires um, some introduction to optimal control. Uh, I also skip uh, the part on pseudo-Bayesian approach. As you uh, have seen, uh, the design depends on the true values of the parameters which we want to estimate, uh, so with, which complicates many things. So in, this, uh, in order to um, circumvent this problem, we can use adaptive design. Alternatively, we, could, we can assume some probability uh, distribution of prior distribution of, of the parameters. And uh, then, instead of maximizing a de-optimality criterion, we can maximize the expectation of the de-optimality criterion. The expectation is uh, with respect to the prior distribution of the parameters. The question is how to construct uh, such prior distributions uh, for the parameters. Well, if we don't know uh, anything about uh, the distribution of the parameters, we can assume a, a uniform distribution over a given area, which is usually a hyperrectangle, or we can use something which, is, which resembles or which is uh, a multi-normal distribution. But in what follows, I'd like to show you something which is even more up-to-date. There are many papers up appeared in, in this uh, area uh, in recent years. Uh, I think the story started by the publications by uh, Hubert Tenorio uh, and co-workers. Uh, Andre Bardov uh, introduced something uh, related to um, uh, ill-post problems. Uh, then uh, papers which were even more exhaustive uh, 
much more comprehensive uh, by Alan Alexander Jan and uh, his, his uh, and his group were published. So in what follows, I'd like to present our results in this area uh, in collaboration with Roland Herzog and Ilka Rido, uh, his former PhD student from the Faculty of Mathematics of uh, Technical University of Chemnitz. Mm. So the kind of problems uh, to be considered is the following. Let's come back to the example of a metal block with a crack. Well, we hit the block from one side, but this time, apart from the diffusion coefficient alpha, we want to estimate the initial conditions, the initial distribution of the temperature. Uh, Previously, we assumed that this initial distribution was known. So, again, it is easy to say, but how to done it? Uh, the difficulty here uh, comes from the fact that <coughs> the initial distribution is not, uh, well, a vector. It is a function. Uh, so it is an element on inf an infinite dimensional functional space. Most often we assume here that it is uh, the space of square uh, integrable functions. So how to, how to uh, identify su such functions? So here you, you can find some papers, some most representative papers on this, uh, on this, in this area. Uh, for many years, uh, the a key problem here was how to um, find a counterpart of Bayesian inference for infinite dimensional spaces. And, well, some breakthrough was achieved by uh, Andrew Stewart. Uh, well, this paper is among highest uh, citable papers uh, I've ever seen. Uh, it was published uh, some, almost 10 years ago. And since that time, many papers appeared. I think that papers by uh, Alexander Jan, Petra Stadler, and Gattas are um, among the most valuable of them. They implement uh, the ideas set up by Stuart. Uh, here you can find less known papers by Gejaza and uh, Viktor Shutayev. Uh, so these guys are from uh, the data assimilation community. Uh, they don't use uh, the results by Stuart uh, literally, but uh, the results they obtain are quite similar. And here you have some papers by Andre Bardov and uh, Haber Horish Tenorio in the same spirit. So. I will give you some results which, which maybe will introduce you in, in this area. Uh, our application is the following machine. Uh, this is a prototype machine. Uh, well, this, this is a tool. The question is how to position this, this tool at a given space point. So we want to position it uh, at a given space point with a high accuracy. But how to do it? Uh, this machine is moved by two drives. One drive is on top of it. Th the second drive is at the bottom. And um, uh, this drive on top moves this part up and down. And this drive on the bottom moves the machine left and right. The crucial problem here is that the drives uh, produce heat. And heat um, warms up uh, the whole block. When the block hole uh, warms up, it deforms. And uh, if it deforms, the position of the stool changes. We want to avoid th these changes. So this, which means we want to predict the changes in order to uh, correct the position of the tool. But how to predict? the changes of the tool uh, uh, implied by uh, the warming of, of uh, the machine. So this was a very fine uh, problem coming from 
um, well, well, <laughs> from applications. And uh, we wanted to uh, obtain measurements for pre prediction. And the question was where to put measurements, where to put sensors. So this is the heat equation which describes uh, the warming of the whole block. Well, this is uh, usual stuff. Uh, the problem here is that the thermal conductivity, represented here by lambda, uh, it changes. It is different on top, it is different on the bottom. Well, there are some, some five parts of this block can be distinguished uh, where uh, the value of lambda is, is uh, different. So, well, we have five parameters lambda here. And um, uh, we also have deformations and deformations are described by the following system of linear elasticity equations. Uh, you, you see here that both the phenomena are uh, coupled. Uh, you can see here the temperature which intervenes here, which influences uh, the deformations. Well, I'm not an expert in, in mechanics, but uh, Roland certainly is. So, well, invented all, all, all the descriptions. Mm. So just like in the setting uh, used by Alexander Jan and all, we adopted the following approach. We use the final element method. Let's recall me that uh, here we can uh, partition the special domain. Of course, the machine was in three dimensions. So uh, here you can see only some intuitive example regarding two dimensions, how to do it. Uh, this partition, uh, this triangulization can be uh, some rough, uh, can be rougher or can be finer. Uh, so the question was how to optimize uh, this number of uh, subdomains in order to make the competition afford competitions affordable. And um, we expressed the initial temperature and the solution uh, of the state equation of, as, a con as a combination of basis functions. And uh, basis functions stem from the final finite element method. So for the triangulation, you, you can see here, one such function is one at one node, a zero at all other nodes. So using uh, such basis, fu basis functions weighted by some unknown uh, temperature values. Uh, you, can, you can construct some profiles for such, uh, such an initial temperature and such um, uh, and uh, the temperature during time itself. So we represent the temperature as a linear combinations of uh, the basis functions, they depend only on space, and uh, they are multiplied by uh, the values of uh, the unknown values of uh, uh, the temperature. They it, it depend only on time. For the initial uh, temperature, uh, these are constant values, but also unknown. So after this discretization, we have the state equation, which have the form of a, uh, ordinary, of a set of ordinary differential equations. Uh, the problem is that the number of these equations is pretty high after uh, the um, discretization by the finite element method. The number of these equations is, about, is more than, uh, uh, than uh, 25,000 but it is quite normal in uh, finite element computations. And here we have uh, equations for the sensors, for the observations. Mm. So we use a Bayesian, a Bayesian approach, which means that we must have some guesses, some prior guesses regarding, uh, regarding um, the initial temperature and its dispersion. So uh, the in initial temperature is some function parameterized here using the basis functions. But anyway, we must n know some uh, initial uh, guess about what temperature is. And we must have some guess about the dispersion. So we must have 
the, the covariance matrix for the values of the initial temperature, and the same for the parameters. Well, the most critical question here is how to construct, especially, these uh, covariance matrices. So, informally, the, prob the problem is formulated very easily, but in the computations, you can see that the choice of the matrices is crucial for the results. So this is, uh, I, I think, uh, I don't like in this in this approach, but well, this is my point of view. On the other hand, I don't see any alternative now. So well, why not to use it? Uh, so the question is how to uh, minimize, when we want to minimize, uh, we want to identify the parameters, the diffusion coefficient and the initial temperature, we minimize the following criterion if, apart from the terms you see in the usual least, least squares criterion, you have here two additional terms. One regards the deviations from the initial guess about the uh, initial temperature, and uh, here you have the initial guess regarding the parameters. So, so these two terms penalize uh, excessive deviations from these initial guesses. Otherwise, if you don't include these terms, you have an ill pulse problem in which uh, even uh, very small noise in the observations may drastically change the estimates. So, uh, uh, you uh, quickly come into trouble because it is hard to show that uh, the optimal solution exists. I it is hard to show that it continuously depends on the measurements. But you must have the so-called regularization uh, of, of this problem. So this is quite normal for identification with these dimensionalities. So these terms are absolutely necessary. No, these are different. So, so these are for parameters. Right. So, um, depending on which one you pick, they yes, yeah. more importance. Yes. So there's some factor in the means. Yes, yes, yes. So you must uh, you must uh, have a precise knowledge of what 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 uh, the variances here um, uh, can be. Here, uh, most often uh, a diagonal matrix uh, is used. Uh, the question what to place on the, the diagonal, but here this is, the question is much more complicated because you assume that you have a special uh, random process and uh, you have a covariance operated char operator characterizing um, the randomness and you, you can have many, uh, a, a large number of possibilities here for, for, uh, this, uh, for the covariances. Uh, so, a specific uh, type of covariance you assume here may have a big influence on the location of the sensors you really get. Uh, in order to make the computations uh, much more effective, uh, here some technicality is made. So the covariance operated for the initial state is defined as a solution through a solution of, a, uh, of an elliptic problem. This is uh, due to the fact that in this way, only two parameters are uh, sufficient to parameterize the, the covariance operator. And uh, here you can find the interpretation of the, these parameters. Um, in this way, it is, you can easily include uh, uh, this, co this co covariance into, um, into uh, the computations. So basically, you have the covariance for uh, the parameters here. The expression is, <laughs> looks uh, very simple, but the problem is that the covariance here is a matrix which, is, which has more than 25,000 rows and more than 25,000 columns. So this is a key difficulty here. So ah, yes, yes, yes. I, I, I'm going to, to, to finish. 
so the question is how to minimize the trace of such a matrix. So you can use uh, the following approximation. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, luckily, we didn't need. Uh, we we can. Our case was was even simpler because uh, we wanted to opt, uh, to optimize the accuracy of. Uh, um, uh, Predic prediction for the tool position. Uh, so we wanted to predict in the most accurate manner uh, the vector uh, zeta, which, is, uh, which has three elements. So this matrix, which multiplied our uh, state uh, uh, vector, this vector was huge, it, it had uh, 20,000, 25,000 elements, was multiplied by a flat matrix which had only three rows. So it, it simplified many things. So um, basically, in our case, the criterion was even uh, simpler. So it, we avoided such problems with um, large-scale computations to a large extent. And uh, well, Basically, the tool we used here was simply cell decomposition. So what I just mentioned, and um, well, and the results were very promising. The, you get here the places where the weights were maximal. Uh, this suggests that the sensor should be put here. This is quite logical. This is in the close vicinity to the first drive. This is in the close vic vicinity to the second drive. So well, this confirms that it, also, it, it has a sense. So this is a confidence ellipsoid for the tool position. So it works, works pretty well. OK. Well, this is two, two minutes after the end of the mini course. Uh, well, at first, I wanted to present you some, something, um, uh, many more things. But uh, well, unfortunately, the time is not that easy to operate. I hope that um, well, this encouraged you maybe to, to uh, invest some time in order to get some knowledge, some more advanced knowledge in this, in this area. Um, well, this is, a, I think this is one of the most, respective, uh, most prospective areas currently, because well, uh, we are in the area where, uh, in the era where everything is measured around us. One of the most prospective um, research directions, maybe, away from uh, what I uh, outlined you, is uh, experimental design for uh, big data, experimental design for uh, observation selection. Uh, so here you saw that we have a number of sensors and we w want to select the most valuable uh, sensor, uh, sensor positions. Mm, uh, similar problems uh, can be uh, encountered in machine learning. We have well, a big volume of data, but some data are not very, very valuable. Some are. The question how to locate them. And um, there are some first attempt to attempts to use experimental design to, uh, in this context. So well, I, here I'm, I'm very opt optimistic about it. So thank you very much for your attention.